when I first started, it was, you know, if I said to someone, yeah, I, I do jiu-jitsu, they would they'd usually be like, oh, is that like karate or, or what's that, you know? Whereas now, I'd say most people will know, you know, through, through probably through MMA and, and the UFC, they'll know that it's some sort of grappling. Coming from a more formal martial arts background because I'm, uh, I did Taekwondo for 15 years, I'm black belt in Taekwondo and um, have fought at an international level. When I came to Jiu Jitsu I thought, I, I didn't know what Jiu Jitsu was so I was like yeah, you know, I'm fit, I'm strong, I'll be cool and I got killed. <laughs> you know, I just got destroyed. So after my first lesson of Jiu Jitsu man, I, I like, I hated it. I was like so, like disappointed in myself and also just so blown away by how hard Jiu Jitsu was. And so for two weeks I didn't go back. I was just like stomping around like, man, I hate Jiu Jitsu. Damn Jiu Jitsu. And it just burned a hole in me, you know. And then eventually I just was like, you know what? I have to learn this. And uh, yeah, man, I went back two weeks later. I bought a gi and man, it's just never stopped from there. Like I just uh, fell in love. And it just uh, keeps um, pushing me to get better. why I started Jiu Jitsu, it's, it's because of the submission. I came in, I was 14, you know, I was 30, 40 year old young kid. I went in there, people beat me up like this, I used to think I was strong, you know. And they're just submitting me. I didn't start just because the guy got side control on me, you know. I started just because the guy submitted me. The guy got me an armbar, he locked me up in a triangle, he locked me up my back, choked me, I had nothing. I had no other option but to tap, so that's what got me this for, you know. So, submission. That's, that's the motto, right? So I've been with that motto since, some, since the beginning days. It's what makes you. So I started training at a place called Jiu-Jitsu Lifestyle, which is just up the road from here. Um, it was like this tiny as room, like, I don't know, three by four meters of mat space, like nothing. Um, and it was uh, Brett Tamblin and Bernie Jenkins were my head coaches. And yeah, I just jumped in and started training as much as I could. I was probably, I was pretty overweight and you know, I was really interested in, in mixed martial arts and stuff. Basically what really motivated me was when I watched like the early UFCs, I saw like West Gracie just like dominate these guys who were like way, way bigger than him. And I was like, well, that looks incredible. So I'm gonna do that. Everybody was Kung Fu fighting. Those kids were fast as lightning. Come on, Billy. Play your game! Use the Dalai Eva! No! Not the leg drag! No! I started... I was playing football at the time and I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to do something to look after myself, to protect myself on the field because the bigger footballers uh, were picking on me, but I was a lot more unfit then, I was a lot smaller. And I wanted to learn how to protect myself, so I went to, to an MMA school and we did like one session of groundwork and I was just hooked. And then I, I started, I looked for a school closer to home because that was about an hour and a half away. And I found a small school about the size of a, a fridge. And it was, uh, Bernie Jenkins was running the school, who was a brown belt back then and, and it was called Extreme. And I only did it just to learn how to protect myself. And then after about 10 months, I went to watch a competition and there was a white belt that me and him were sort of going back and forth. And I, uh, I remember him winning and I was just like surprised. And I thought, wow, if he could win and I, I could possibly win. So I competed about a month after that and then competed again and again and again. And I, I went through all the color belts like fairly quickly and try to compete as much as I could at, at the highest level I could. 
I'm not going to come here and teach you, you know, my five favorite techniques to do and then get you to practice it and take it home. You can find that kind of stuff on the internet. There's thousands of techniques out there. What I want to give you is the tools for you to develop your own guard passes, for you to develop your own method of passing, so you never feel stuck. So no matter what position you're in, you have a solution. The way my brain works is very uh, improvisational, and the style of learning I did was very improvisational. I was never really interested in the the fun I found in Jiu-Jitsu was from discovering my own solutions to the problems at hand, and I never really enjoyed being told what to do. I was always more interested in discovering that through problem solving, through trial and error. So I learned through a system, there's a lot of different uh, names for it, but you can call it experiential learning, where I pretty much just made mistake after mistake after mistake and learned from it, but eventually I started gaining a really good fundamental understanding of Jiu-Jitsu that thrive more and more. The more of an understanding you have in something, the easier it is to attach new information to it. So my learning curve started off a little bit slower than most, but it went high. And when I say slower than most, I still did okay because I was quite athletic when I first started as a footballer, but my technique was disgusting. But it took a while to sort of build that, and then it just got better and better. And now I feel like I don't need to train near as much. I can just come, you know, do 30 minutes worth of like hard rolling with some of the really good guys here, and I feel like I'm continuously excelling. When you come in with the white belt, you're just freaking out. <laughs> I mean, we all come in like, yeah, I've seen, seen that armbar. Oh, I got, you know, a bit of terminology, but you just have no true concept of what's going on. But I think from what I've learned is like, once you kind of achieve your blue belt, you're really starting to see things and then get frustrated because you can't solve the problem, you know? Then when you get in guys that get to purple, they're seeing it, they're solving the problem, they're coming up with strategies. And someone said to me, you know, that's where you really form your game. Like the game you have when you're purple is, is, is like your taste, your taste in Jiu Jitsu, whether you like more technical aspects or you like a more power game or whatever it is. And then you kind of cultivate that to brown and become more attacking and really hone it. And then black belt, well, then they, I, I don't know. <laughs> We've got a few here, but they say that's when it opens up because then it's like, well, what else can I learn? And then you, you realize that people, you're a black belt, but then that someone's been a black belt 20 years. And how much more knowledge and technique do they have than you? I think, for me, I had different instructors at different stages. So I started under Peter Dabin, and um, that was a great place for me to start. And I learned some very like, amazing fundamentals that set the baseline for me. Then I trained under Dan Cherubin, who I think probably has the most amazing guard in Australian Jiu Jitsu history. He's amazing. Um, I love that guy, and he taught me so much about, like, the meaning of jiu-jitsu and to be creative and to be playful and find new positions and invent things and then um, after training under Dan I trained under um, Thiago and, I, and also now training under Lockie. Training under Lockie is amazing and um, I've always admired him and he's such a, a humble guy and such a technical guy so us getting to roll we both have that understanding of what it's like to trade in Brazil and he's really brought his own approach and technique to that here so it's awesome to see how white belts blue belts and purple belts develop here and it's just accelerated because there's no boundaries here we don't say no this is not a white belt move it's like yeah there's syllabus you learn that and if a white belt wants to learn something we all share it and I think that's how jiu-jitsu is accelerated you've got people who are like well this is hard but if you're a white belt and you're keen you can learn it whereas when I first started I was like no you just learned this and you just learned this. So I think I just see the art evolving rapidly. So white belts now are just doing next level stuff. And blue belts are like already like world championship level. And you know, so I feel like white belts, blue belts, purple belts now, it, it's so many more people doing it. It's so much more competitive and information is so much more readily available. It's just like amazing to see that progression. So now I just, uh, and, and, and all the best guys say it, like a belt is just a belt. Like you're only as good as you practice, you're only as good as you represent your belt, you know. We had this guy in Brazil called Guy, he's this little guy, he had like one leg shorter than the other, so he had a real bad limb. He had the best guillotine game ever. I saw him guillotine Bernardo Faria. This guy's tiny, he could guillotine everybody. So if they've got a new big black belt coming to the academy, like not from the at Alliance in Sao Paulo, they go, oh, just go with Guy. And they see Guy like limp in and he's like little and they go, like, Pfft. He would just like put him to sleep, like he's so good. And that's the thing, like you can't underestimate anybody. 
And that's why I feel like sometimes people get really caught up in belts. And really it's just about your own process, regardless of belt. White belt is just like discovery, you know? Like you first, it's like when you first, you know, open your eyes to the world and sort of you realize how like stupidly vulnerable you are. You know, you see people who are you know, in the street who have no understanding of like grappling arts and they don't know. But when it really starts to click for people how really vulnerable they are, they, you know, it changed, it can change the game for a lot of people and puts people on a good path because when you hear about like ego filters in Jiu-Jitsu, um, that's kind of the biggest thing because you get people who come in and they think they're, oh yeah, I'm 100 kilos, I can bench, you know, 150 and all this sort of stuff like, you know, gym goers, you know what I'm saying? Um, but they have no idea about the dangers they can be exposed to just by some guy, you know, school teacher, electrician, whatever, you know, they can mess up your day and it's, you know, not gonna be a good time. So when that happens, it, it'll either break, like make or break a person, right? In the sense that they'll either go, oh, I don't like this at all. You know, this little guy's beating me up. I'm a bounce. <laughs> or they'll go, wow, I need to learn this and I need to learn it now. <laughs> I've got to start, I've got to catch up. That said, not everyone starts off with a big ego. A lot of people come in, they're sort of shy and unsure. And over time, they develop that confidence because they're like, well, I'm training this thing where I can use a systematic method to submit. And so for someone who's, you know, a small girl or a young boy or something like that coming in, it's kind of shy, that's a huge confidence boost because now all of a sudden, you know, they, they train for a year, year and a half, and some new guy comes in who outweighs them by 20 kilos, and they submit them you know, half a dozen times. You know, that's a huge confidence boost. So it generates a, a different sort of a breed of people, but it, it uh, sort of guides them in the same mindset that they all, you know, came from this vulnerable place and now they're a bit stronger. I was born in a family, you know, I lived with my mother and um, just the family circumstances um, made me a very, made, like, well, from a very strong age I had a lot of responsibility to, to take care of, so when I was 14 I was, I was thinking like a 20 year old at times, you know, so and just my character, I think my character necessitated me to go part, down this path, but I always had, I always thought a few years ahead, you know, when I was 15 I think, yeah, when I'm 20, when I'm 18 I want to be here. You know, when I'm, uh, when, I'm 20, when I'm 23, 24, I want to be here. Right now, I, had, I look five years ahead, you know, and that keeps me focused and uh, not mucking around. I don't like, you know, I don't like to go around, party, muck around too much, you know. Um, just keep focused on what you have, you know, uh, and then achieve things. Inspire people, you know. First, just, you know, and inspire yourself first, you know. Once you inspire yourself anyway, others take from that light, you know, that you distribute. So. Just, just laser focus, man. You know, laser focus. You know. Um, I remember when I was 14, 15, I was watching some of the black. I was watching my instructor compete a lot. You know, he was one of my biggest inspirations. You know, he was. He had the same instinct. You know, that what I what I displayed today as the brown belt in Australia, that submission instinct. He had the same one, man. You know, so he wouldn't he wouldn't care about position. He'll see an arm and go after it. You know, and he'll take it. And he won pretty much most titles in Australia too. And uh, looking up to those guys, looking up to. You had like uh, Daniel Cherubin, you know, he's competing back there too. Uh, he was a monster of black belt, you know. And, uh, and Murat, like, remember the year I came here, he got his black belt, and he was the um, first ever Pedro Sal black belt in Australia. And he's the one that um, brought Pedro down here and, 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 and started the started the legacy for him here, you know, pretty much. I, I watched him compete a lot as well when I uh, when I was at the other club for a year. And I'm like, who should I go to? Who should I go to? Who should I go to? And I just saw, man, I came here because he's the man, you know, he was the man. He was the only one back then that was going for the kill, you know, going for the submission. A lot of guys will, a lot of the guys will just pass the guard, stay there, win, you know. This guy will pass the guard, even though he's down on points, he wouldn't, he wouldn't go for an e-ride, for example, get that two and win. He'll go for the triangle, he'll go for the arm bar from there, you know. So that just got me, because that's what, that's what it is. You want to change, you want to have that kind of juicy. Because we have the similar body type, things will be shorter, but... You know, and, and similar body type, similar mindset. We went very far together. Getting beat up by him every day. You know, I was a kid, getting beat up, and it makes me who I am today. You know, and just to, and that Pedro Sal lineage. You know, and Pedro. You know, as you know, Pedro is one of the best instructors in the world. You know, so and then I met him. I made connections with Pedro, and, and here we are. You know. 
my, my Jiu Jitsu world was very much limited to just my coaches at the time, and I, you know, I used to love watching like Pride and MMA, so I used to like try and copy whatever Kazushi Sakuraba was doing. At Turbo Belt, I got exposed to you know, competition Jiu Jitsu, and I started watching people like Rafael Mendes when they just started coming up, and that really. Uh, and Marcelo Garcia and so on, and that really influenced my game then. So, I suppose my coaching style, I, it's really hard because like I have my favorite moves in Jiu Jitsu. I've, I think as a coach, I, I try to learn a very broad range of things, even things that are not my A game, because I think that there's still, even if I, you know, there's certain types of guards and so on that I definitely wouldn't go to by choice, but sometimes I'll end up there, and because I've worked that at some point in my jiu-jitsu uh, career I'm able to uh, bring it out and just do something from there to whether it works or just to get me back to a position I want so I try to have a very broad style and I also try to teach a broad range of things not just my game I think uh, and I encourage my students to do the same thing and work their own style as long as as long as doing something that I, I think it's good to do something that's proven to be effective you know, like you see People who watch something on YouTube and they'll be like, oh cool, look at this move. I'm like, I've never seen that done before in my life. You should spend your time doing something that, you know, uh, to me, like that a, that a high world class athletes able to pull off against people who, who are very good because you can see how they, you can actually watch them, see how they're countering all the, the proper counters and still able to get that to work effectively. So I try to encourage people to explore their own game, but at the same time, I think it should originally at least, be uh, imitating someone who's, who's high level. Not necessarily like based off my game, I mean, that's what I do. I sort of try to take things from a whole bunch of different people. Um, but yeah, like develop their own style. Um, in terms of the way I'd structure classes, I think for the advanced guys, you know, just situational training, start in a position and work from there, reset, go again, reset, go again, and you get to, you get to try and fix your mistakes on the spot, so if someone you know, if you're working your takedowns and you know, your single leg takedown, for example, and you kick starting from there, you'll notice common patterns on how people are defending, and hopefully you're adapting while you're trained to fix that, fix any errors, and, and making it high percentage. Obviously, the person's going to get better at defending as well, but um, I think you learn better than just straight out rolling. I'm um, doing that, um, and then uh, obviously you usually finish with rolling, so that, that helps us identify weaknesses and, and just get some good fitness and so on. Um, in terms of the atmosphere, I try to keep it pretty relaxed. I'm not too strict. You've got to be tired because you don't want to let people just do whatever they want. Because if you lose all structure, people don't train hard. So you still need, I think you need some structure. Um, but I don't like to be too pushy to, you know, uh, I like to give people a bit of freedom because that's what I would want as a student. I know every time I travel, like when, uh, if I go to a different gym, uh, you know, there's, there's so much. Uh, for me personally, like for example, a warm up. Like if, if the gym does like a 15 minute warm up, I'm usually. To me, I just want to go there and train. <laughs> like I, it's, it's, so that, that's how I run my classes. I, I run it how I would like to do it if I was traveling or, or going to a gym. I've got a blue belt. And I wrestle a little bit. I um, I took Richard down today. Did you? Mm. I, I submit Daniel all the time. mind the ultimate goal is to be perfect to the point where you know, it doesn't matter who it is how big they are who, what their technique is you know the goal is to be you know immaculate in the sense that e even uh, translating into my mixed martial arts as well you know you want to be able to punch and not get punched you want to be able to you know kick not get kicked you want to be able to block every punch or move your head out of the way and not accumulate any damage that's that's the ultimate goal and so for me aspiring to such a, a really unachievable image of what I want to achieve, it always keeps me hungry and motivated to be better every day. In the Jiu-Jitsu community, I think my mindset is one that's not super different, really. Like, the, the whole name of the game is to achieve submissions and 
win, you know. You have to be kind of a little bit insane to want to do what we do. Like, to the point where, like, you know, people are trying to kill you, effectively, is what the, the goal is. You know, when you, when you tap out, it's like, I'm dead, or you've immobilised me completely. In, uh, in Jiu Jitsu, there's a number of different sort of people, you know, it, it um, attracts people from all different walks of life, like different careers, different you know, genders, interests, everything, right? You know, boys, girls, whatever. Um, but when it comes down to it, there are people who, there, there's a few different types. There are people who devote a little bit of time and they just sort of dabble in it and they explore this, you know, interesting thing that they've seen on TV and they think, oh, that's cool and they'll kind of generally do it for six months a year, burn out, they'll do something different, you know, and they'll lose interest, which is fine, you know. Um, I'd love for people to stick around through it, but it's not for everyone. Then you have people who are, you know, just chippers. You know, they, they chip away and they gradually get better, but, you know, depending on how young they start, they may never really reach the top game, you know, and that's, that's okay. Um, and so, like, um, in progressing, you have people in the, who are, you know, competition motivated, who want to try, you know, uh, aspire to be high-level grapplers, and myself included. Um, so <clears throat> I think even within, like you, you say, there's like white, blue, br purple, brown, black. You know, that's the the ranking. But in the same sense, there's like different levels to that. So the expectations of someone who's like in my own position, where I'm 20 years old, I train pretty much every day. You know, the expectations for my performance is different from someone who's say 50. You know, and they're a purple belt as well. You know. They don't have to be killing everyone on the mats. They've done their time, you know, they've earned that position in the, in the sort of social structure of, of a gym. So, you know, the way in which belting applies, I think, is very age-specific, which is why, obviously, there's master's divisions. But, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic and one that I'm really glad to be a part of. Once I'm here now, I'm going to grab a bit of the pants here, or I can underhook the leg if it's no gi. Um, I generally like to underhook the leg because I like a lot of leg attacks. As you progress through in training, it's just about how well you can use your tools. And so, master tradesperson is a black belt in their craft. So, over time, you just become more and more proficient at using your tools. And, um, I think that for my progression coming towards Brown, it becomes a lot about understanding um, how to set traps and make people think that you're going to do one thing and then hit them with one of your other tools. Um, it, it gets intricate to explain, but that's, that's, I feel, the next progression, you know. Doing things in the way where people think they're having a victory in doing some sort of movement, when really it's a trap. Yeah, so when I came into Extreme, it, it was apparent that there was a few, like, top dogs. Um, Bernie was the toppest dog, <laughs> um, but then following tightly behind is probably Brett, uh, or Tambo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Tambo, because it's much easier. That's why I know him as. So uh, Tambo sort of, when I started training, he was a purple belt, long time purple belt, and he's just a destroyer, right? Um, but as he's gotten older, he's, you know, he's gotten his black belt and everything like that, but um, the lessons that he's sort of instilled in me have really sort of shaped who I am. So um, touching back to, you know, being young and stuff, when I, when I was probably 16, I had my first like amateur little fight and, uh, that was good, but it was just like some little low-key event. And I learned a lot of lessons about what it means to be like well-rounded in mixed martial arts. But, you know, at the end of the day, I was like 16. I didn't even, I didn't even train in striking or wrestling. I just did jiu-jitsu. Basically just dumped in for the lols. <laughs> and then a little while down the track when I was like 18, I, um, at that point I was a blue belt. It's pretty confident, like, you know, in, in every 18-year-old's mind, when they become something that's a bit special in the, in the, in the gym. They, uh, they can lose sight of you know, what it means to be humble or you know, have respect for your opponents and stuff like that. So uh, <clears throat> my first MMA fight after I started learning wrestling and striking was pretty successful. I won quite convincingly in the first round. Um, my second fight at amateur, I, um, I jumped in and everything was going to plan. I got this guy to the ground, got him in a reverse triangle, and at, at that point I had him locked in. I looked over at my friends and I'm like, got this guy, you know? And uh, turns out I didn't have the, re the reverse triangle. He started to escape. I modified it and I eventually got the finish, which is a great lesson, you know? You know, it's good to be able to adapt to your training. But 
the fact that I'd done that and had it, I thought I had, had, had him in the bag when the guy had heart and he pushed on. And I, I, you know, credit to the guy, he got out. Word got back to Tambo and uh, it's not pleased. So this is one lesson that I won't forget anytime soon. Basically he, uh, so if you've ever seen Extreme, we're on a big hill, right? Anyway, and we've got a big tra uh, tractor tire type thing. And uh, he made me drag the tire all the way from top to bottom of this driveway. By the end, my hands were bleeding. And he's like, that's the lesson. Do that again, and you're not gonna, you know, it only goes worse from here. And uh, that was a pivotal moment I learned from there, you know. And uh, Tambo really taught me that good lesson. So I'm, I'm glad to have him. I think Jiu-Jitsu is, is, a, is a portrayal of your character outside. If a guy is very aggressive on the mat, very stubborn, he's not giving submissions, or he's tapping and he's not, he's not letting go, all these shifty things, you know? Uh, so your character on the mat displays your real character, I think. And I, I'm 100% I'm sure of this, because I've, I, I hang around with the guys here, and I see it, you know? Like, you go for a sweep, he gets, he gets angry, you know? And he gets, he gets emotional. <laughs> So outside the same, you know, so you bag someone or you do something, you see, boom, you see the character, you know, and even outside the mat, yeah? How do we know someone's true character? One, you step on their table, yeah? When you step on someone's table or you, you say something they don't like, someone's true character comes out. If the guy's humble, he'll stay humble, he'll say it in a good way. If the guy's if has a good, big ego, what are you saying, man? You know, like, you know, same thing on the mat, you know? The guy will react the way he is on outside the mat. So. First mistake my opponent makes, I'm gonna catch it. You know? I'm not thinking, see, I'm not thinking this. I get it on my platter, yeah? I'm not, I'm not thinking I'll sweep, I get the two points, I'll stay on top and I'll win. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking if I get the whole platter, I should dislocate the elbow. You know? If he doesn't tap. That's what I'm thinking. I should dislocate his shoulder. You know, I'm thinking that. Obviously, I'm not going in there with cocky attitude. If I catch the old platter, I'm going for the finish there. You know, I'm not going for the sweep. If when I'm going for the finish, if the sweep comes, there's no problem. You might say, if that's my last resort, I'll take the sweep. And my first resort is always the submission. So the first thing he, he posts, I catch him. I get him off. Just, just flow and make him and um, make your opponent make mistakes. So fight him that way. So that's always yeah, maybe if you felt it like I roll and I, I make you make mistakes. I, I keep you busy constantly, you're posting, you're moving, and the first mistake you do, boom, I tap you. So same in the competition, I go in there, it's 130 kilos, 100 kilos, 90 kilos, 80 kilos, 60. First mistake he makes, I'm gonna finish him. And this happened, I remember I had a fight, uh, this year in Sydney, first fight, I finished in like five, six seconds. I pulled, boom, from on part, I got an armbar. There was one fight I had in the Melbourne Open, two years ago as a build up three years ago I fought a European champion in the final and everyone's like man pull guard he's got a nice he's got a good guard man sweep him play your guard you know you'll win like that and it's because this guy was pulling guard it's submitting everyone sweeping everyone winning everyone on his guard I'm like nah man I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna unbar this guy because he's posting with his arm every time on my hip on, 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 on the guy's hips for them not to pass so I'm like he's posting I'm gonna catch that arm he's gonna post do the same to me you know so I thought man no matter what happens, I'm gonna go for the submission. I don't care if I lose by points, I'm gonna catch that arm. Even if I don't, I'm happy. I leave the place, I went for the I went for the kill man. I didn't sit there and, and lose. I went for the kill and lost, you know? You know, so and I did, and, and then they actually caught me a triangle, I got out of the triangle, I passed his guard, he stopped the pass with the post, and I armbar him. And uh, I won the absolute thing because I can wait final. So if I wasn't to get the armbar, I'll be proud of myself too, because I went for him, man, I went after him. Many examples, good and bad, you know, where I lost and this, this, this kind of style costs you. It costs you, it doesn't always get you the gold, but it gives you something else, you know. It gives you something else not many people could get, you know. I think my success comes from my loyalty, you know. Like, if I wasn't this loyal, I wouldn't feel this, what I'm feeling. That every time I win a national title or a Pan Pacific or a state title, and um, 
I would have feel the same thing, you know, where if I was switching gyms constantly, just to get better, switching gyms. That's selfish, man, you know? And I think everyone, with the atmosphere they have at the gym, they could do so much. It, it just, it, it's all up here, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mindset of training. You know, you could make a blue belt into a black belt. When you're tired, man, that blue belt becomes a black belt. Or you can work positions you've never worked on that blue belt, and the blue belt's gonna feel like a black belt. You know, so I think with that loyalty, my success is meaningless. That's what I, what I think. And I'm gonna, gonna win that world title with, by being loyal, you know. I'm not gonna switch teams just to win a world title, but I'm gonna win it, I know that. I'm gonna win the world title, flying the Nexus flag, you know, for being, being loyal. And, and, and that's, that's, you lead by example like that. Then what do the next generation do? Because being loyal is a good thing. It's the correct thing to do, you know? And all the youngsters, because I teach in, a, in, in Greenbelt, in the northern suburbs, two times a week. I've got a good student base, 20 to 30 youth, you know, uh, between 14 to 25, very strong, hot, like um, hungry animals there, you know, like full of testosterone, you know, just calming them down, treating their egos. And, and you want to lead by example. You want to teach them loyalty, you want to teach them the right way, the right pathway, both technically and in terms of perception, you know. And uh, but you'll see, even now, you look at the world you just seen. You look at guys with strong character that were loyal. in competition and especially hard training and stuff there's there's not there's few things that can kind of give you the same feeling that competition can especially at a high level so I think that stepping outside your comfort zone is a huge thing in life that a lot of people really don't do and if you're doing jiu-jitsu competitively you're always stepping outside your comfort zone because you're kind of naked out there it's not just the fact that you're not so much worried about lose like getting beaten but you're worried about getting embarrassed because you're kind of displaying your art against someone else's and as much as you shouldn't take it that way, it's, it's always like a scary thing. You put expectations on yourself and you want to meet those. So every time you go on a competition, you're battling you know, your own demons to try and step outside and do that. So I feel like it really helps in other areas because you sort of build confidence in yourself. And especially when you achieve good things too, you, you back yourself in doing it in other areas. So it definitely helped me moving into acting because I was definitely on camera a lot with Jiu Jitsu uh, and you're in the spotlight a lot. So you feel a lot more calm in acting but there's still two different you know, kind of beasts. The good thing about Jiu Jitsu is you get nervous and you get an adrenaline dump and you've got something to put it into. To be honest, I don't really, um, I don't really idolize people in Jiu Jitsu so much. Uh, when I first started, it was more like the people I'd seen in magazines. So it'd be kind of like an experience when I would see like Shanji Vieira and I'd meet him in real life because uh, I saw him in magazines and stuff like that. But you, you slowly realize that they're just people and uh, they're just like you. But I definitely always have people I looked up, look up to, but it's more about what they're doing. So I'll see certain patterns or certain styles that I like, uh, not so much the tech, on the technical side, but just sort of certain things that they put out there that I really like, and I want to try and you know, uh, adopt that into my style. And especially where I first started, we, were, we barely even used the gi, and I barely even used guard. And I remember going to my first world championships as a blue belt, and the thing that struck me the most was these people jumping guard and wanting to get guard. And from where I came from, it was like the last thing I wanted to do was get stuck on my back. So it was that was the first sort of like eye opener. And now it got, got more and more professional, and especially in the last two years where I've had off injured. I've seen a massive growth in, in what's happened, especially with submission only competitions and prize money. And uh, they're trying to get like more spectators to the sport. So I reckon the last two years that I've had off, well, I've kind of stayed watching a little bit, but I've been back from it. It's really had a, an exponential growth, uh, which is really good for the, for the athletes because they could start making money and you know treating them more professionally. But it's still got a long way to go in my eyes before you know 
people can really you know make a lot of money just competing there's a huge growth in the submission only events at the moment and I feel like it's because it's easier for spectators that don't have an understanding of jiu-jitsu to, to watch I feel like the the better jiu-jitsu that I like watching more the the point stuff is a little bit uh, more confusing for the spectator that doesn't understand what's going on so it's it's hard to predict I feel like it's going to go further down that road of just more viewers and, and stuff like that but I I don't feel like I have the knowledge to honestly make a, an accurate prediction of where it's going to go but I just hope it goes you know, keeps getting bigger and bigger, so. I, I see it change so many people's lives, you know, and it's changed my life in terms of just becoming uh, more, more humble and, and just accepting that, like, never truly master it. Like a lot of things we think, oh I can never master this, but like that's a great thing. Even the greatest guys will say you can never you can never master this. It's always that improvement. And I've seen so many people once they get on board with that and accept that you see their whole like you see the light bulb change and then people are just so into it. When I first started, you know there wasn't as many black belts. There was a plenty of like awesome black belts, but it was fewer. So when you saw brown belts or black belts there was only a few and it was like oh that was like a real rarity. And now it's awesome to see generations come through because all the guys I came up with, they now got their black belt. So there's this whole other gen of black belt and a whole other game. And I think it's just learning accelerated. You know, like all these great guys, um, like all the top teams, they've put their information out there. They've got subscriptions online. You know, you can go overseas and train with them very easily. It's all set up now. So many seminars, so much information. So. You've got like, very intelligent people coming to jiu-jitsu going, well, you know what, I don't care about any other rules, I'm just going to learn as much as I can. And because they're a self-motivated learner, their game's going up super high. Whereas I think before, when I started, it was very much like, oh, this is my instructor, I must learn whatever he teaches and this is all I do. Do you know what I mean? So coming from a formal martial arts background, that was like what I was used to. But what I learned is like jiu-jitsu, it's up to you. You drill more, you train more, you level up. The more math time, the better, and you just push and push and push, and it's up to you to um, kind of negotiate the way. And now when I have a look at the young guys, like just being in Brazil and seeing nine-year-olds just like flying arm bars, they're like white girls and just like beating their chest, I'm like, ah, oh, like, oh my god, what is that kid gonna be like when he's 18, you know? And that's that's the next generation again. So I think like there is definitely trends in jiu-jitsu, but it's only getting better. And now with what's great with the um, kind of, I would say revival, but the popularity of submission grappling and submission only, and like no time limits matches, this is bringing Jiu Jitsu back to like a real origin point. And I'm not like a traditionalist, but I've been really lucky. I got to train with some of the best coaches in the world. Fabio Gergel said to me, that's Jiu Jitsu, like no time limit, no points, no advantages, just, like exhaustion and grit and determination and, and technique and so I think that's like a really exciting part of Jiu Jitsu now so I feel like that's bringing a lot more people into it and obviously with the um, progression and popularity of MMA Jiu Jitsu just grows too. Uh, actually what did Hobson Moore say something to me? Uh, I, was, I had a chance to chat to him and I think he said like, um, like if you fight for a medal then you can be a champion but if you, if you fight for a medal, you can be a great champion. But if you fight for jiu-jitsu, then you can be a great person. And in terms of style, a lot of new things are coming up, you know. But I see a lot of white and blue belts, you know, they're trying very weird moves, you know, before learning the basics, you know. It's fine, it's fine to try it. It's fine to try it, but not base your game around it, you know. Like, uh, base your game around the foundations, you know. When you want to base your game around the foundations, it's easy to add those, add those moves, you know? So, like you're a blue belt with very good foundations, then when you come to purple belt or enter your blue belt, you start adding all these small tricks, small details, fancy moves, then those fancy moves make sense. But um, once you start playing all those games as a, at the early stages, what happens? You create loopholes in your game, you know? You know that when, when the guy counters that, you don't have anything to fall back on. But once you have the basics, that doesn't work, I know I'll play my normal guard, you know? And I'll submit him from here. But it's always good to play. Some people, are, 
on the other side, so I'm a little scared to play. Play these fancy games. It's good to good to get out there, you know, chuck yourself in the deep waters, you know. So when I started, I pretty much just watched MMA and copied that, and I'd say that was the style back then, like close guard. Uh, you know, people probably didn't even know what half guard was that well. Like, or at least like to have a solid game plan from there, and then. Um, Close guard, mount, very fundamental stuff. Now it's totally, it's totally different, but I think it's better. Like I actually think even the, the fundamental positions we're doing them better now than we used to, and that's where I, I think a lot of people get that wrong. They think oh the old school's good for street fighting and the new school's just good for you know sport jujitsu, but I I think that's totally wrong. I think uh, the current application of the the, the modifications that have made, been made to the old school stuff is, is much better leverage. Uh, and if you're doing it the way they were doing it 20 years ago, I think it's not as efficient as it could be. And this, the, the thing that bothers me the most is always the people that talk the most, I have no idea what I'm actually talking about, and they bag me and they say, oh, Kip doesn't know what he's talking about, and that you're talking about it, and they're like a guy, and they may be a world champion in your life, uh, world champion in Jiu Jitsu, but they've been training 17, 18 years with other world championships, uh, with other world champions, with world champion coaches. You see us in Australia training so, like a much shorter amount of time and doing the exact same thing, but just excelling a lot quicker. Whose process is going to be better? It must be ours. You know, if you take 20 years to do something, or someone takes four years to do something, he's probably doing something that you're not. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of these, these you know, top level black belts really need to step back out of their ego and just say, okay, maybe this guy actually offers something I can learn from. And every time I've had someone like open their mind and listen to what I say, they always understand what I'm saying. And they, you know, whether they adopt, adopt it or not, that's why it's one thing, you know, knowing it's not enough, you must apply like Bruce Lee said. But uh, it, it, that's one thing that frustrates me is the most people that attack my theories on this don't understand it. And when they do, they stop attacking because it makes sense.